Tallahassee Historical Society. Um, first person I want to thank tonight, and there are lots of people to thank tonight, uh, is Casey Smith, who did our food and who edited it. And who, along with Rebecca Woofter, edited the Appalachian Magazine. Now, this time about a week ago, when we were emailing back and forth, I told KC that we had about 70 people registered for this meeting. Then last Friday, we had about 75 registered for this meeting. Then at the beginning of the week, we had about 80 registered for this meeting. And this morning, we had 100 people registered for this meeting, which is by far the most of this year, and a tribute, I think, to our, to our speaker, Diane Roberts. Um, we've got several announcements tonight before we, um, before we introduce Diane. And first person I want to introduce is Will Gandy, our treasurer, and then he's got an introduction to make, and this is going to be interesting. Will, take it over and talk loud. Sure. Luckily, I work at the museum, so I shout at kids all day, so hopefully this is loud enough for you guys. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So as most of you know, we had our board retreat at Amicus Brewery last year, and it was a wonderful success, and we've become good friends with the people at Amicus. It's in the historic Waterworks building, which most of you know about. And we have something exciting planned with them. I would like to introduce some people from Amicus, and I would like to introduce some of my friends from the Tallahassee Beer Society. Now, just to give you a little bit of a rundown, I'm sure some of you know what that is already, but they were founded in 2017, and on top of being just a beer society, they've become an ambassador for all of the food and drink in this region. They have a membership card that has over 70 businesses that you get perks to, and not just in Tallahassee, not just in Florida, but also in Georgia and Alabama. So I have some friends from the Beer Society, and I also have Amicus here today to talk about something exciting that we have planned. So first I'd like to introduce my friend Danny Aller from Tallahassee Beer Society, and he's gonna come and talk a little bit about what they do and what we have planned, so. Beer. All right, we've got two other people that are on their way, but I'll go ahead and, uh, and get it going. They'll probably come in uh, shortly after. My name is Danny Aller, I'm the co-founder of the Tallahassee Beer Society. Um, my uh, other co-founder, Matt, is uh, I think probably parking right now. Um, so I'm kind of the, the guy that sort of connects the dots and does a lot of the uh, kind of front of the house marketing for, for all the beer society, um, helping put together the card. That's kind of the idea guy, sort of the business guy behind the scenes. He helps put a lot of these kind of implements. I come in with an idea and he's like, well, we might be able to do this, we'll see, you know, and then I task him with doing it at that point. So uh, we have another uh, idea here now, and that is to, um, uh, to come up with a society uh, collaboration beer. So beer society, historical society, uh, we're going to kind of come together as one. Uh, we're going to all work together um, at Amicus. Uh, we decided to, to do the beer at Amicus because you guys are really good friends with uh, Amicus Brewing. Uh, Sheldon Steen uh, should be here at some point here in just a minute as well. Um, so we're going to we're going to get together. We're going to come up with, and this is really why we're here tonight, is that we want everyone in the room to sort of think about uh, what would be a great uh, beer to, to brew for two societies coming together. Uh, you've obviously got the, the beer side of it. We're all about the craft beer. You've got the historical society, about the historical uh, aspect of it. So we want to sort of marry those two together. Um, we like you guys to think about names, styles, um, things like that, what you're doing. Um, and Matt's got a couple of notes here that he sent me, just in case he wasn't able to make it in time. And I'll sort of run down uh, what he thought about uh, what would be a good beer to do. So uh, for starters, uh, Kentucky Common is a style of beer. Anybody familiar with that style of beer, Kentucky mm -hmm. Common? Yeah, it's a very, very kind of unusual style, but it's also the oldest style of, of beer that there is. Um, it's uh, super popular back in like the 1800s, 1900s, things like that, early 1900s. I was thinking about maybe a, um, a riff on that, a Capital City Common, Capital City Uncommon, Centennial Common. We also wanted to try to tie in the centennial of Tallahassee this year being 200 years. So we sort of like to marry all of those things into one glass of beer, if you know. So um, uh, the Kentucky Common is kind of an easy drinker, sort of a throwback with a historical society that kind of made sense. Um, another one uh, is a Brood IPA. Anybody familiar with the Brood IPA style? Oh, no? okay. So Brood IPA is, uh, uh, for anybody who's not familiar, is a very, very light IPA. Mike works. <laughs> uh, 
it's a little too well. Yeah, there, right. <laughs> it's a little hot. If we uh, we could have worked that a little bit earlier. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thanks. Thank you to Will. Thank you to Will and the staff here for working with us. I think everybody can hear me okay for now, so until he gets me to go ahead, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hold off. So the other one is, a, is a, another idea is a brood IPA. Um, a brood IPA is a very, very dry style of an IPA. Um, it's going to be hoppy. It's going to be kind of white uh, in color as well. But also, the thing that ties us in, I think, very well for this beer is that it's kind of the champagne of beers, and it's got sort of a very sort of a dry champagne. With it being the centennial and 200 years, we thought maybe brewed IPA, toast a glass of champagne. So you've got the old school style of Kentucky Common we're thinking about, uh, the brewed IPA. And then also, um, there's another style that's really easy to drink. And I also think that we probably need to, to come up with something here that's very approachable for people who maybe don't really like beer. We want something that sort of everybody can drink. We don't want to come out with a crazy dark beer or a sour or something where people immediately recoil and say, well, I don't want anything to do with that. We want something that's kind of you know, easy drinking. Um, and one of those other styles is going to be a cream ale as well. Um, it's kind of, again, sort of a light kind of a lager uh, ale st uh, style. Um, but with this one, we could do something where maybe we add uh, grits to it, Bradley Country Store grits, something that's got like a lot of historical to it. And people brew with grits, I promise you, it's a, it's a thing, it happens all the time. Uh, how much grits they actually use in the beer depends, but something like that, Bumpy Road Farms but might be cool as well. Um, and then also, you know, just sort of, we could go back to a real traditional style, of like a pre-prohibition lager, right? Uh, so we're, you know, we're, we're really going back into the, the, the depths of history right there at that point. So. Um, so this was just kind of an introduction to sort of tell you that we're thinking about this. Um, Sheldon's uh, from Amicus is going to give us the go-ahead when we're ready to brew it when all the ideas kind of come together. Um, I encourage you to submit ideas to Will um, here as well. If you've got ideas for a name, a style, um, any kind of ingredients you think might should be in it at all, just sort of come together. We're going to do a society beer here because we have two societies here in town, the historical and the beer society. And we figured it was kind of a marriage made in heaven. So that's sort of where we are right now. And sorry we couldn't make it last month. Everybody had something like unusual happen like a couple days before the meeting that prevented all of us from being here. So I appreciate you guys letting us come back and, and talk to you about it today. And if anybody has any questions at all, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Yes, ma'am? Is there any local history of beer here in this area? Yeah, yeah. so um, it's not real, not real long. Um, the, uh, the first production brewery, obviously, in Tallahassee was proof. I think everybody probably knows that uh, in 2012. So they've been around now for 12 years. Yeah, older than that, I mean, not, not really. I mean, we've, you know, we've had a couple of breweries that were sort of before their time uh, back in the day. Uh, the Mill, we may have made the Mill Bakery and Eatery. So the Mill Bakery and Eatery was one of the first ones to brew their own beer. You couldn't get it anywhere else. You had to go there to do it. They brewed right on site. They would serve it to you right there. You couldn't go to a restaurant, couldn't buy it, couldn't take it home, anything like that. And then after that, uh, in the late 1990s, uh, Buckhead Brewery, and some people who might remember that over off Capitol Circle, uh, where the crafty where the crafty crab is now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So that's that's really the only uh, only history we really have here um, to speak of, anyways, in terms of a, a recent history. Um, so yes, sir. Just going to mention the ale bottles from around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Are pretty common in the archaeological record here. They're ceramic instead of glass. Yeah. So are they are they reusable? Do you know or? Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they certainly could be, but yeah. uh, you wouldn't want to use one that's been down, you know, buried. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> something a little fresher, but they yeah, yeah. certainly could be. Reusable. Well, I mean, but you but you think about it, so in addition to having a beer that we can all drink and enjoy, there's nothing wrong with an idea like that. To maybe bottle a few of those as mementos and keepsakes that you would never open you would just kind of keep on a shelf to say this was kind of a piece of history or something that we do so that's a great idea so. let me ask you let me ask you since we do have several other announcements to questions and comments please grab you at yep. the end of the meeting or grab you individually and thank you so much absolutely that's a great idea. Absolutely. Great idea. And I'll, uh, um, I got I to gotta take my daughter to dance from here, but I'll make sure to get Will my email. Yeah, everybody can uh, reach out to me, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just reach out to Will, and, and we'll, uh, we'll get a good idea on paper, and I think by the next meeting we should probably have a brew date, uh, a name, a style, the ingredients, and I would actually ask if anybody here would like to be involved in the brewing process. I'm not saying you've got to lift big, heavy pounds of grain or put tops in, but if you just want to come and observe, 
take part in it, be as involved as you want to. We would like to have as many of you there in the brew house the day that we actually brew the beer. Let's That's make possible. some history, guys, right? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I'm afraid to unmute this now. Let's is that better? Yeah, okay, good. So it works, good. Um, second thing I wanna to say tonight, in two weeks, is that right, a little bit more than two weeks, the first bicentennial event sponsored by this organization will take place, and that is the uh, Tallahassee Bicentennial Antiquarian Book Fair at, uh, at the uh, Elks Club, February 23rd through 25th. We're gonna have a number of book dealers there. Tallahassee is a great book town. I wanted to ask Susan Mick, whom I uh, asked to help organize this for us, to come, to come say a few words about it. Well, I don't think I can compete with the beer, but we'll give it a shot. <laughs> uh, the planning, the organization is ready. And we're at the point where what we need is you. Uh, not just to attend, but also to volunteer. And we're going to have a, a uh, volunteer sheet afterwards out in the lobby so that you can sign up if you would like to help. Uh, a book fair is rather unique, and it certainly is the first one that we've had in Tallahassee. The closest, perhaps, that I could tell you is um, it's kind of like an antique show, and those have always been popular in Tallahassee. It's just that book dealers are a little bit more passionate about what they do, <laughs> and uh, we have several coming, and they're going to be bringing all kinds of books. We've got first edition literature, We've got uh, Civil War, we've got children's books, um, postcards, memorabilia. I think the postcards, are they coming out right now, if, if we can, so that you can see uh, some of the things that are going to be there. Um, we celebrate history, and we do it in a lot of different ways. This evening, we're, uh, we're listening. You know, uh, at other times, we, uh, we are activists. We read. We, lead, we uh, <coughs> collect. We tell stories. There are all kinds of ways to share history. And this is an event that's pretty much going to bring it all together. Uh, we'll begin on Friday evening, the 23rd. And uh, we'll have a wine and cheese from 5 to 9. And um, the mayor is going to come and say a few words. And Bill said that she would come and uh, speak with us as well. Um, then on Saturday, we'll be there all day, as well as on Sunday. Along with the book dealers who will be there, we have one little section in the front corner where we're doing elder storytelling. And this is something that, um, that we've almost forgotten about over time. Um, but so far we have three persons who are over 90 years old who are gonna sit and tell us stories. They're not, not going to be speakers, they're gonna be storytellers. Uh, one is Jack Hadley. Uh, some of you may know him from Thomasville. He started the Jack Hadley um, African American Museum. Oh, he is a piece of work. I love Jack. And his parents worked on uh, Pebble Hill Plantation, and so he grew up there. You think he doesn't have stories? And then there's uh, Flo, uh, Flo Ashby. Uh, I was with her one evening at a celebration, and we got to talking. We were both Hoosiers. And, uh, and she said, yeah, she'd been in Tallahassee a long time. She was here when we went from FSCW to, uh, to FSU. And I thought, really? So she reaches out and she goes, now, Susan, she said, everybody thinks that just happened overnight. Yeah. No, 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 it wasn't that way at all. <laughs> and she launched in and I thought, oh my gosh, there's another storyteller. You know, and, and we're gonna miss these opportunities and yet it's such a, such a beautiful way to, to take things on. 
any of you who are grandparents know perfectly well that your grandkids will say, tell me another story about when my daddy was little or, you know, this and that. So we've got the, the elder story time. Don't cut me off. I I'm going to cut you <laughs> <laughs> One more thing, we're also having collectors, okay? Local collectors who collect historic things and are going to come and share their collections with us. Okay, um, some of you may know uh, Lou Hill, Dr. Lou Hill, mm -hmm. an amateur archaeologist, and he knows more about Appalachia Cola than anyone. So <coughs> he'll have a table, he'll just be sharing among us, and I'll let you go because Bob says it have to. <laughs> Again, grab her at the end of the meeting, talk about this, because we do need volunteers. Third thing I want to say, third part, third, third thing I want to say, I want to ask, uh, our own James Call to stand up. He said he said he won't come down, but you guys should have gotten an email today from huh, tomorrow. You're going to get an email today, um, sending you a link to a story that James ran in the Democrat uh, today. I think they are as part of the bicentennial. They want names for 200 people. Who, who changed Tallahassee history, who affected Tallahassee history, who were key to Tallahassee history. So look at the link when you get it. Come up with names and, and send it to James. And I think this is a really, really great project. Bob? Yes. One more thing. Yes. On well, Sunday afternoon, we have several families who are sharing. Uh, there's the Birds and the Boyds and the Butterworths and the Bradfords. <laughs> Okay, and all the together. And gonna have more later. Uh, that's three. Fourth thing I want to do is ask uh, former Mayor John Marks to stand. I would say take a bow, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh <laughs> Mayor Marks and his wife have a foundation. And that foundation joined the Historical Society this week. They are our second corporate member behind Visit Tallahassee, and we are so pleased that you are a member. So pleased that you are a So that's number four. The fifth and last thing before I introduce Diane um, is we are still planning our field trip on March the 9th for Fort Gadsden. We are trying to decide where we should rendezvous because instead of trying to do this by bus, we're probably going to do this by caravan. We may meet here. We'll see. We may meet here around 9 o'clock that Saturday morning and consolidate into as few a cars as we can get and sort of follow ourselves down there. It's about two hours, a little bit more than an hour and a half from here to Port Gadsden. It'll be a great field trip, and uh, you'll be getting more emails about this and so forth. And so finally, it's your turn. Um, I don't know quite what to say about Diane Roberts. I think a lot of people probably feel that way. Diane is an extraordinarily brilliant person. Um, she teaches in the English department at FSU. Uh, I did indeed read her book, which I think is from her doctoral dissertation about women in William Faulkner's Fiction and it was so rigorous. I had to go back and read it again. It's a really, really good book. But Diane is also a journalist, of course, and she has been a journalist for God, everybody that I can think of. The New York Times, the Tampa Bay Times. She now you can probably catch her, I guess, more than any other place on the Florida Phoenix, which is which is an online which is an online paper that I check every day, by the way, because I want to see what she's written. Um, 20 years ago, Diane published a book called Dream State, and uh, I bought it and I read it then, and it's about to be reprinted. And when I read it the first time, the book it reminded me most of all of was Gloria Jehoda's book, The Other Florida, and Gloria Jehoda was a, was a member of of this, of this organization was president for a couple of years. But both books, I think, are really love letters, love letters to, to North Florida, to this part of Florida, 
in particular, but also to family. I mean, this is a this is a wonderful book, and when it comes out, everybody should get it again. And so, um, you're tired of hearing me talk, and so I'm going to turn this over to Diane. And, and welcome. We're awfully pleased to have you. hear me? Okay, I can stick this up here <laughs> somehow. Um, thank you so much to Bob, uh, who's also wearing an awesome pair of shoes. Um, <laughs> beautiful shoes. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for showing up, good heavens, on a Thursday night when, I don't know, y'all could be probably doing something else. You might be checking out all that beer. I don't know. <laughs> but it's very kind of you to come, and it's a great honor to be able to speak to you. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything. I don't do that. I just talk. Uh, I'm a college teacher. I've been doing it for a long time, and so I just talk. Uh, and you can ask my students how they think that works out. But, um, you know, I'm really impressed, I have to say, with this. This is so beautiful. I just get, wow. I mean, that's quite a production. And I see that it's, things have end notes. I like a nice end note. You know, uh, means it's properly scholarly, right? Um, which I, I still sometimes play with scholarship, but maybe not as much as I used to, because I quite like writing nonfiction books, which are not scholarly books. And I'm impressed that Bob read uh, Faulkner and Southern Womanhood, which is a book I will not read again. Um, I, as, my, <laughs> as my much loved professor, Jerry Stern at FSU said, the words are very close to the page. <laughs> he liked the scholarship, he just didn't like the way it was written, and neither do I now. Mm -hmm. So anyway, y'all are all probably much more versed in history than I will ever be. I do English, um, I tell a lot of family stories in Dream State, uh, some of them check out as accurate, some of them don't, many of them, nobody can tell. Um, the family, you know how this works. Uh, a lot of times what people think happened is more important to them than what really happened and has more power. And here in the South, that's always been the case. Um, I'm gonna read y'all a little bit of recent history given that it's the well, it's the 20th anniversary of the publication of this book, which is coming out in, in March. And if anybody, I was under the impression that anybody that wanted the thing in Tallahassee had the thing. But then if you don't, there's a little flyer thingy where you can get a discount. I'm all for people getting a discount till the end of February. Uh, I'll also be at Midtown Reader on March 28th, because Sally Bradshaw very kindly invited me to do a thing, which the thing, I guess, is me reading or me standing around and, you know, letting people talk to me, or maybe I get to hide in the corner and they talk to themselves. I don't know. Uh, I'm happy anyway, but uh, that's what's happening. If you want one, get it, get, get it with the discount. Why not? It's 20% off. I believe in a sale. All right, the beginning of Dream State um, takes place when Tallahassee was only 176 years old as, as an official date, only 176 years old, uh, in the year 2000, which is, still feels like recent history to me, but for my students, it's like, oh God, my parents were, were like, Six. <laughs> now, and I tell them I don't. I, I don't think that checks out. Um, but y'all, if you were in Tallahassee in November of 2000, you know that it was um, somewhat peculiar, to say the least. And I kind of got. I was like um, a native guide. Anybody who was who would, lived in Tallahassee 
that knew some journalists. We were sort of like, ask her where the sushi is. You know, ask her where you get this or that. Because so many of these reporters showed up on a plane, okay? They get off in Tallahassee. It's November. It is cold. It is dark. It is rainy. They are upset. <laughs> because they thought they were going to like Florida, you know, palm tree, swimming pool. And they're like, what? We're going to freeze. Nick's Toggery downtown sold out of umbrellas and sweaters and jackets. They were so happy. But there was a, a guy that I knew slightly. He had been at the then, it was called the St. Petersburg Times. And I kind of would take him around and show him stuff. Um, he was particularly taken with uh, the May Oak stump. <laughs> he could not for the life of him. He's going, it's a stump. I said, yes, it's our stump. <laughs> and I explained to them, him about the May party and how important oak trees are to us and that just because the tree is no more doesn't mean that we do not love it. <laughs> no, May queens were crowned under that tree. Did y'all know, by the way, that Faye Dunaway barely missed being May Queen? I, yeah, that was something I didn't know until recently, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Faye Dunaway lost? <laughs> by six votes, she said. We have a history of very close elections. <laughs> so this was one early evening on Adams Street when this guy that I call the Up North Reporter um, and I were sitting there having a drink, you know, just like a lot of people um, who, you know, what we're doing is watching to see who comes by. We're not really, uh, you know, reporting, reporting. It's just that we're looking to see if anybody, I guess what we would call important, shows up. And you know, this was back when cell phones were a little bigger, but you'd still see these guys walking out the street, <laughs> one in each paw. So anyway, this was a particular Friday evening, and this is what was happening. Adam Street is starting to fill up, not just with eight-foot cameramen lugging battery packs, like Sisyphus pushing his rock up a hill, and tiny black, black jacketed NPR correspondents toting digital recorders no bigger than an evening bag. They've been here for days. But sports fans hollering, go Gators, or FSU, FSU. This is the downtown get down, a city sanctioned street party held every Friday evening before a Florida State home game. Large men in orange and blue or garnet and gold suit jackets, squire women with orange and blue bows in their hair, or hats spray painted gold with garnet streamers. Small boys in two large University of Florida jerseys and small girls in Florida State cheerleader outfits cling to their parents' hands and demand french fries now. <laughs> well, says the up north reporter, as he gets ready to launch into the crowd and gather local color. <laughs> He says, at least this isn't political. <laughs> That's what I did, I laughed. Which shows what he knows. Florida State's team is called the Seminoles after the native people dispossessed or slaughtered by Andrew Jackson's empire making machine. When the Seminoles were nearly gone and so safely romanticizable, Florida State chose them for its nascent football team. In the 1940s and 50s, the few real Seminoles left made a tourist attraction out of fighting what was assumed to be their natural enemy, aside from white people, the American alligator. For a dollar, you could see a Seminole wrestle a live gator. The Up North reporter and I debate whether to decamp for pecan-encrusted grouper at Cyprus, now late lamented Cyprus, or stay here and eat. It's getting colder but Adam Street is smelling faintly of Bud Light and tequila. It's getting interesting out there too. In front of Clyde's, two guys in chinos and blazers 
and two girls in cashmere twin sets are lined up swaying and singing, we are the boys of old Florida, F-L-O-R-I-D-A. Somewhere over by the First Baptist Church, I hear the FSU fight song. We're gonna fight, fight, fight for FSU. We're gonna scalp them Seminoles. UF's mascot, a guy in a green plush gator suit the color of AstroTurf, starts mock tussling with an FSU cheerleader trying to mess with her pom-poms. More camera crews are showing up. More orange and blue, more garnet and gold, and now the signs, bushwhacked. This is America, count every vote, and the theologically dubious, God made George W. president. <laughs> the singing come spelling competition uh, carries on, well-dressed young white professionals bellowing, F-L-O-R-I-D-A, F-L-O-R-I-D-A, S-T-A-T-E. If nothing else, I can tell you a Florida University education will teach you to spell some words. <laughs> um, and here's part of the marching chiefs coming along too, and a fight starts. <laughs> right in front of the offices of the Florida Education Association. <laughs> one staggering FSU frat boy and one staggering UF frat boy, veterans of happy hour somewhere else, each accuse the other of dissing him. Then a guy in a Gators for Gore t-shirt steps in to defend his fellow UF fan who looks at his shirts and yells, sore loser man. The Gator for Gore who put his football before politics is insulted and gives the sore loser man a push. A couple of frat boys holler not helpfully, are you ready to rumble? And laugh like tickled toddlers. One of the well-dressed young white professionals quits his crooning and heads in their direction despite one of the cashmered up girls hanging on the sleeve of his Hugo Boss jacket saying, now Peyton, now darling. <laughs> Suddenly there are a few dozen people shoving one another and yelling, asshole Republican, go to hell Gators, you lost in Gator Bay. Um, the headline, by the way, in that day's Tallahassee Democrat was, Officials hope games fans behave in front of company. <laughs> that was just, believe it or not, it took me a little while to realize that was weird. <laughs> because it is Tallahassee and we understand. And y'all know, of course, that the, the sad story of all the important people and journalists who were kicked out of their hotel rooms because it was a football game. Yeah. <laughs> and we all had to try and explain that to them. Like, you just don't understand, man. It's a ball game. <laughs> but um, this is one of the reasons I love Tallahassee uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to come back to Tallahassee. Uh, I always swore I wouldn't teach at FSU. I mean, when I was a lot younger, because it'd be like teaching with my parents and that would be weird. But uh, I later on, I went, it's not, I write about Florida. I think about Florida all the time. I should be living in Florida. That's what makes sense. So I came home and I'm never ever sorry about it, much as I rant and rave and carry on about things I don't like. Um, and there are always a lot of things I don't like. But now Tallahassee is officially 200. Um, of course, it's, it's much, much older, much older, which I like to stress because even though we have an official time when we became Tallahassee, capital of the state of Florida, uh, where I was brought up is on a, it's, it's a hill, but it's kind of hard to tell that it's a hill, it just is, um, out the old Bainbridge Road and it's where people have lived one way and another, or at least stayed for at least 5,000 years. We're about a mile as the crow flies from the mounds at Lake Jackson. And I was raised by people, my parents, who were also native Floridians and who were very proud of this, very, very proud of this. My father was from Wakulla County, my mother from Washington County, um, very different kinds of families. The Roberts family and their extended pieces, which uh, they never saw much difference. They're, you know, 
Roberts's, Tucker's, Taft's, Voss's, Broward's, all kind of in the mix, all of them um, in the county. You know, it's not that many people in the county. I mean, there are a lot more now, but in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, everybody in the county was kin, pretty much. Uh, my mother came from a big farm in West Florida where she was an only child. But my grandfather made sure she knew the history of her family. Uh, his family were called Gilbert at one point, a member of the Bradford family, the poor branch of the Bradfords. <laughs> they were cousins of the much richer Bradfords of Pine Hill Plantation and Bradfordville. But this was, this was a really lousy farmer named Isaac Bradford, um, who had two daughters called Roxanne and Amanda. And my great-great-grandfather, John Wesley Gilbert, who I swear to God had a brother named Charles Wesley Gilbert. Um, you know, and they weren't even Methodist. They were Presbyterian, but whatever. I think it was the hymns. But, uh, you know, he married Roxanne Bradford. And they were so puffed up at the idea that the Bradfords were, you know, fancy people, that ever after, um, somebody, in, uh, one of those sons at least, is called Bradford. And I thought this was goofy until I did the research and discovered, yeah, they really are descended from William Bradford. We, I should say, are descended from William Bradford, uh, the pilgrim. Uh, so are a, a gazillion other people, because all the Bradfords had like 10 children each. So, you know, Bradfords are everywhere. Um, but that was exciting. My brother's called Bradford. My grandfather was called Bradford. So, you know, and we are constantly saying, no, not like Bradford. Nothing to, <laughs> nothing to do with us. Um, so, anyway, this idea of Florida as a place with a history, um, this is why I'm so glad y'all do what you do, because as you may have encountered people who come to Florida because they think, and hope that it's just an eternal present. You know, the beach, what history does the beach have? The beach is the beach. You don't think of the beach having a history. Um, of course, everything has a history. When my parents were, were breaking the ground for the foundation of their house, um, it's, it's on a clay hill, not just a hill. Um, my, it was a hard rain one day and my mother who was a potter and was always interested in looking at clay. Uh, ours wasn't good enough to use, wasn't that, you know, the right kind. But she went around looking and she found arrowheads and spear points and a very beautiful ax head, really in good shape. Lots of pottery shards. She just picked them up, put them in a bucket. Um, hundreds of pottery shards. A few interesting things, mostly just too small, but also uh, bits of pipe stems, bits of blue and white china that would probably have been, you know, English 18th century stuff. I mean, we have the years in our ground. Um, we have the whole history of the place, even though our house is not old, built 1957, uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's a 1957 house. It's brick and it's long and it has a picture window. I mean, nobody would look at that house and go, wow, what a cool house. Um, it's, it's the land and the idea that people have lived on that spot for so, so long and that the mounds there which are not quite as old as that spot, but much grander to look at. Those mounds were started around the same time as many of the great cathedrals of Europe. Those, that's medieval Florida, the mounds. You know, we keep thinking Florida is new and Florida is very, very old. Um, we know this from what archeologists come up with all the time. You know, the canoes, if y'all seen that ancient canoe they have in the museum in Gainesville, that's the most amazing thing to me. Um, and the pottery, the things they found at the mounds, beautiful, elegant, sophisticated art. Um, 
And I think that one of the best things about living in this place is that we can assert that history as well as our official 200 years, which we should do and we should celebrate that. And we should definitely you know, be aware of whose history we're talking about. Um, <laughs> this is like class, y'all. <laughs> Except in class, I'm like, <laughs> you know, bless their hearts, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm used to way worse than that. Y'all are super well behaved. Um, but, you know, that we can go to Cascades and it's it's very different now, obviously, that when than when, you know, our two gents showed up and one of them said it was like fairyland with the waterfall um, and the trees and how beautiful, you know. We, we, we've done a good job with something that was utterly destroyed uh, during uh, less clued up parts of our history. Um, but I went to, when I was little, baseball games at Centennial Field, which was there. And that's all gone now. But it is remembered. And the job of any of us, when we're interested in what the past has bequeathed to us, what our ancestors have left us, maybe people who aren't our literal ancestors, you know, what the native people of this place have bequeathed to us, it is a responsibility to acknowledge it, uh, to honor it. I mean, we're standing in a place that I think is a brilliant recreation and celebration of a mission and a place where I discovered when I was working on my book Tribal, which is, you know, it's about college football, but not the game, just the culture, <laughs> that, that the Appalachian people play ball here. You know, we're, we're very close to the stadium. And I'm like, my God, we've been playing ball in this place for 400 years. You know? Which just shows you that things we think are brand new are not brand new. Um, people that lived 400 years ago maybe haven't left us a lot of stuff, but they've left us some letters, some maybe journals, maybe... A report. Uh, we can read Cabeza de Vaca's uh, account of when he got rather desperately lost in the swamps and it took him a little while to get to Mexico City, um, <laughs> by which time he had adopted many of the ways of the native people because that's how he survived. And he writes about that. And remember that the Spanish, we're talking about the 16th century here, the Spanish were on a mission uh, which was dual. The one they liked to talk about had to do with bringing people to the one true faith. And they thought that if they could beat everybody in the new world, colonize the new world, they would grow all of these good Catholics and stop the Protestants from messing stuff up. If you've ever been to, well, there you can't, it's a, it's a sign now, but Fort Caroline um, in what's essentially still, you know, it's Jacksonville. Um, there, were, there was a French Huguenot colony because the French kicked these guys out of France on account of they were Protestants. So they set up shop in North Florida and the Spanish came and killed them all because you can't have Protestants messing up your territory as they thought. But you know, if you get all these good Catholics and you spread them all around the world, they seriously thought that this was a way to retake the Holy Land and Jerusalem. They called it the Reconquista. And you know, they of course started this, we think 1492 is our date when Columbus actually discovered, you know, Haiti didn't discover America. Um, the children are still told this, and I really wish they weren't. But um, 1492 was the year that the king and queen of Spain, Isabella and 
Ferdinand, known there as Los Reyes Catolicos, uh, kicked out the Jews and the Muslims, uh, or made them convert. And you know that that's all part of a political project, as well as a faith project. And then there's the gold and the emeralds, because you can't you can't achieve worldwide domination without a lot of money. As y'all know, probably Florida was a huge disappointment to them. No gold, no emeralds, no nothing really. No nothing they could use. It was their point of view, there was nothing. Um, we of course know that, that we have a lot of cool stuff and not just giant mosquitoes. Uh, but uh, you know, Florida is part of not just its own history, not just the history of the United States or what became the United States, um, not even just the history, we go far back enough, of, you know, Mississippi and Indians, but of geopolitics. It was and it is and it will be. I mean, even after some of it's underwater, it will be. It's just that's the world is entwined. And our understanding of the past must inform how we apprehend the present, how we see why things are the way they are. Nothing just appears. It has a long series of things before it that made it so. Just like all of us are products of how we were brought up, where we went to school, what our parents were like, you know, what we chose to do in life. We don't, we don't come out of nothing. We come out of a lot of something. And for what you all do in learning about and indeed researching and writing about the history of this place is all adding up to our not just interesting knowledge. It's not just cool stories. It's things that tell us who we are now and maybe who we will be. And maybe some of it will teach us what we don't want to be and where we don't want to go. But I tend to think more of it tells us so much about who we are. We can explain ourselves to ourselves, which is a way of, I guess, coming to terms with everything and never feeling bad about your history, even if it's terrible, even if you, even if you had kinfolk like some of mine, who, by the way, weren't beer drinkers, they were moonshine drinkers. <laughs> my great-grandfather, who was a very mean, mean man, and called, I promise you, not making this up, Valerius Lafayette Roberts. They, my grandfather also had Lafayette. We are not related to the great <laughs> Frenchman. But they liked that name and they knew his story. They knew that Lafayette owned land here in Tallahassee. He didn't come and hang out here, but he owned land. And the last bit of it that you can see that isn't under other structures is Lafayette Park, which y'all all know, of course. A beautiful and kind of mysterious place, I think. You know, even though it now has amenities. But, and it's tiny, but it's lovely. But Valerius Lafayette Roberts, who was, as best I can tell, he was elected once as a Wakulla County Commissioner, and he seemed to be a county commissioner forever, but I couldn't find anywhere where he ran again. So I guess he decided he was county commissioner for life. Um, but he was a, a nasty drunk with a moonshine still. And his wife, who was a Tucker, a respectable lady, uh, a well-educated lady, uh, got tired of this moonshine crap and went out with a hatchet and broke up his still. <laughs> yeah, uh, he took against this and cut up all her clothes <laughs> with a pair of scissors. <laughs> My grandfather would tell this story and, and he thought it was funny, I guess. Not that story, he thought that one was definitely funny. But he said, well, you know, Daddy would, Daddy would sometimes get real mad and chase the boys around in the swamp with a shotgun. And I'm just like, what? 
Uh, and my grandfather, Edgar Lafayette Roberts, said, yeah, it was a good job your great granddaddy was a terrible shot. <laughs> I was just thinking, uh-huh, yes it is. So, yeah, I'm glad to be here because Valerius Lafayette Roberts was a lousy shot. Um, but, you know, that's, I'm, I'm glad I never knew this guy, Valerius Lafayette Roberts, because he really sounds like just an epic jerk. However, you know, I am interested. And I often tell people, you know, when they go, what, you're an eighth generation Floridian? I'm like, yeah, you said that giant sloth in the museum, I again, folk. Um, no, I mean, I just say, and that gives me nothing extra except the responsibility to tell the stories. And I will always be interested in the stories. And y'all will be glad to hear I'm about to stop and you will be welcome to ask me questions. Um, I'm always happy with questions, but I'm not gonna torture you. I have students that have discovered I can graduate students, but they've discovered I can talk for three hours straight <laughs> if I am not stopped. So I will now stop myself. <laughs> Thank you. And I really, I don't want to keep y'all past time, but I am happy to answer questions if you have any. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to be a storyteller at our event? <laughs> I'm afraid I can't. I looked at the day, and I'm going to try to get there on on one of the days. Or you got a, an opening and a regular day, but I don't think I can do it. But that's kind of you to ask me. Yes. If you're an eighth generation Floridian, when did the order of uh, ancestors come to Florida? Well, the first one was a guy called Francois Bruard. He was a Frenchman from a place called Perche in Normandy. And we don't know as much about him as I wish we did, but I think he was probably a farm boy looking for a better life. He fought in the American Revolution on the American Revolutionist side and he, there are family stories about him doing wonderful things at the Siege of Savannah, but I, I can't find any, nobody's found any documentation. So, you know, it's a great story and it might be true, I don't know. But uh, the minute that he heard that the King of Spain, you know, Florida was Spanish then, um, it had just got traded, <laughs> traded back, well, the Spanish, gave the British Bermuda, which they wanted more than they wanted Florida. So they traded us for Bermuda. You know, yet another disc. But uh, <laughs> they were giving away land. The Spanish never could figure out what to do with it. And the King of Spain said, all you have to do is swear allegiance to me, the king. Don't have to become Catholic. That used to be a requirement. Um, you got a lot of acres if you'd come down with your wife, your children, your mules, and of course, you're enslaved people. He had, at that time, five slaves. And he got land in what's now Nassau County and set up a sawmill. And he got more children and more slaves and more land. And by 1821, 22, he figured out that, you know, Florida's gonna be part of this United States. Thing. The Treaty of Adams Onis was in 1821. And so he anglicized his name to Francis Broward. And, you know, his, but never forgot, that family never forgot they were French. Thus, Governor Napoleon Bonaparte Broward. <laughs> it was his real name, you know. And a lot of the Browards had revolutionary names. So there was a Pulaski Broward and a Washington Broward and, oh, I can't remember the rest of them. Uh, Kosciusko Broward, you know, um, which nobody could spell. But those were all freedom fighters as far as, the, you know, the Browards were concerned. They were very proud of being French. Yes? The first time I heard about you was uh, a man by the name of B.K. Robertson. I often wondered, were you related to B.K.? Very, very distantly. Like maybe fifth cousin or something. 
I mean, so distant as to not matter except in Wakulla County where, you know, Ken is Ken, doesn't matter how distant. Um, but yeah, and I barely knew him. I maybe met him twice. Um, my father would have known him better. But uh, yeah, I mean, I should have said that the first one, I forgot to say, 1799 is when he turfed up in Nassau County. Yes? <laughs> it's the one that's sticking in my head. Yeah. We have, we are in a place where there is history we're proud of and history we're not proud of, but we are where we are because of the part that, you know, is a little bit icky. Um, how do you, and what's your view on how you handle history without snuffing it out? Oh, okay, the question is how to handle talking about history um, in a way that, that does it honestly, and tell me if I'm paraphrasing this wrong, but and doesn't offend people, you have to find a balance. I, um, some of y'all may know, I don't worry much about offending. <laughs> That's, it's not my job to make people feel good. Um, it is my job to tell what I think is the truth and you know truth when it comes to the past is kind of slippy but when I teach I teach southern literature I'm doing it this semester my students read some very distressing things about slavery we read slave narratives we read novels of William Faulkner we read uh, Frederick Douglass's autobiography um, this is not stuff that's going to cheer you right up. It's really not, but I'm hoping that they can see how some things have changed, but we still struggle with some of the structures that were put in place hundreds of years ago. I mean, one of the things that's hard, I think, sometimes for people to think, especially Americans, because we tell ourselves we're a future-directed people. Let's leave the past behind. Let's go forward. You can reinvent yourself. You can be anything you want. And that's true up to a point. But culture, like the past, is a tough old bird, and it doesn't disappear easily. And the echoes of it come down upon us all the time, even when we don't realize it. There are structures in place, especially here in the South, especially our racial structures which even though we don't, we don't have segregation in law anymore, we have it in practice in some areas. Even though we don't, we can't by law discriminate against people for their race or religion or ethnicity, in practice that has not disappeared. And even though one of the funniest things I have ever heard in my life is somebody telling me that I, I was a traitor to my race, <laughs> which I will always cherish, because <laughs> I'm like, good. I mean, a lot of my people made a mess. And I don't, that doesn't make me suffer, it makes me interested. And so, you know, as long as you're accurate, I mean, I would never go out of my way in teaching to be offensive. Sometimes in journalism, I get in a bit of a bad mood, and there are people I would be happy to offend. Who I, I punch up, I never punch down. I do not punch down, that's not, that's not right. But you know, people more powerful than me, sure. Um, my mother used to say, shaking her head, that the entire Roberts family was born deficient, she'd say, of a gene for deference. <laughs> Which Granny Roberts just called us mean. 
and uh, by the way, she meant that as a compliment. You know, it's a mean bunch of Robertsons. Um, and yeah, it's always been a compliment, the Roberts family. Oh, Brenda, she's so mean. Um, yeah, we, we think that's a good quality. It probably isn't, but we think it is. So I, I am interested in a better world. And I write what I write, not just to tell the story of my place to me, because writers always are trying to tell themselves about who they are and why and where they're from, but also to show other people we could, we could fix some stuff, you know, if we felt like it. If we, if we stop being so worried about somebody getting something that we're not getting, um, especially if we really have quite a lot. And I guess that's something that I learned beginning at FSU when I was a little pup undergraduate. Um, there were people around me, my teachers, who were interested in you know, ways, telling stories to better the world, even in a tiny way. And teaching, I think, betters the world in a tiny way. Maybe in a class of 20, I get to two of them. You know, that's a lot. That's you don't know. Thank you so much. Now, um, Diane, you didn't think that we would ask you here to do this and not give you a handsome remuneration. This, I expect you nothing. This is our official Tallahassee Historical Bicentennial Travel Mug. <laughs> wherever, wherever you go in the world, no matter what you achieve, you can say, I have one of these. Yeah, I have a travel mug. Bicentennial. That's right. You don't. That's that right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, all right. Three events. The, the book fair, the 23rd through the 25th. Um, Fort Gadsden, March the 9th. And then on March 14th is our March meeting, and it's something a little bit different because um, our own uh, Claude Kennison, Sandy Brooks, and Doug Alderson are going to be here talking about uh, Florida and Tallahassee kitsch, collecting things. And they're gonna bring a lot of their stuff and you too are invited to bring your stuff that you have collected over the years and to uh, give us a little talk about it. And we think it'll be something a little bit different. We think it'll be, be fun as part of the bicentennial. What more from, what? I'm going to be outside. Oh, yeah. Be sure and see Susan now if you're interested in volunteering in particular for the book fair and see James um, about, about his article on the 200. And thank you all very much for coming. A great turnout. Thank you so much.